Hello, and you are listening to Squash Radio. This is a brand new podcast that wants to bring the inside of squash to life by serving up the best stories. This whole station was a little experiment in itself. We are pushing this even further by testing new ways of getting you these stories. We now have short five to 10 minute video recaps available online. We are trying shorter interviews, capturing people in their moment. And coming up, we are teaming up with some people to do some on-site coverage of events since we can't be everywhere. But here's where we need some help. We are still very small, but have big dreams. Can you help us get the word out, spread the news? Small things could help, like do you have a website and want to embed Squash Radio? We can share a simple code and boom, Squash Radio can be right there with new episodes automatically downloaded. Or support us on social media. Any of these things would be extremely appreciated. Want to get in touch with us? Well, there are lots of ways. Any of the social media messaging apps or email us at squashradio at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening and we hope you enjoy it. What about this? This call is being recorded. Hey there, Squash fans, and welcome to another episode of Squash Radio. I'm your host, Connor O'Malley. Today, we're bringing you another fantastic guest. And this guest is someone who, in any situation, brings a level of enthusiasm and intensity that is 100% contagious. Whether he's coaching his players, undertaking a new project, or a program he is running, his success is derived from channeling all of his energy and taking any challenge to new heights. We are talking about Jack Wyatt, who is the head coach of the women's team and director of squash at the University of Pennsylvania. He has led the Quakers to the finals of the national championships in back-to-back seasons. Jack is an experienced player himself, competing at the top level in the junior ranks and played at Princeton University, winning national championships at both levels. Beyond being one of the biggest fans there is for Team USA, Jack has competed for the red, white, and blue at the, both the junior and senior level, but he has had a distinguished career in coaching the U.S. junior girls team to a historic second place finish at the 2011 World Junior Team Championships, as well as being recognized as U.S. Squash National Coach of the Year. I had the pleasure of overlapping with Jack while I worked at U.S. Squash in my role as director of national teams, where I saw firsthand this master class coach in action. In our conversation today, we kick it off talking about college squash and the recent historic milestone of the Men's and Women's Association officially dissolving to form a new organization in partnership with U.S. Squash. We touch on more ways to help grow the sport at the college level, then dive into the squash program at the University of Pennsylvania, covering everything from how the squash program fits into the overall Penn Athletics Department But then we get into the weeds talking about the recruiting process and cover some of the most frequently asked questions he gets during that phase and how important it is to form great team chemistry. And to close out our conversation, as usual, we turn over to the quickfire segment that I ask each guest the same question. I've always loved hearing the range of answers that these guests have, and this episode is no exception. Well, on that note, I'll turn it over to our conversation, and we hope you enjoy All right, folks, welcome to Squash Radio. And as you heard, we have a great guest for you today. Uh, It's the one and only Jack Wyant, who's calling out of his office at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Jack. Thanks, Connor. Pleased to be here. Well, there's so many topics that you and I can talk on, but with your role within college squash and really being such a driver at all levels within your own team, but then uh, the guidance of the College Squash Association, I'd love to get your thoughts a little bit with the recent governance structure that was announced with working with U.S. Squash and the College Squash Association. I'd love to hear a little bit of you know the background of what you think on the topic. Well, happy to discuss that, Connor. The College Squash Coaches Association, we agreed a few weeks back at our team championships, both the, the men's and and then the following week at the women's to create a new association. I think the name is sort of to be determined, but the, the most important changes, and I, I want to just preface it by, by giving full credit to Wendy Lawrence and, and Martin Heath and the executive committees for each side. I, I have not been on the executive committee in a few years because I've been busy with two teams and, and three kids, seven, six, and four but very pleased with the work that they've done. And and our new association will be joined, which is not the way it's been ever in in college squash. And uh, there will be a 
a board uh, consisting of nine board members, five that are not coaches, which is again something new, four which will be two of which I think for sure will be Martin Heath and Wendy Lawrence and then two additionals. There will be a number of committees that will work closely with the board and the new association has I think stronger ties to U.S. squash so we'll continue to lean on them for their um, with their structure and organization when making decisions as well as obviously running the events. So that's it's a really exciting new development in college squash. I think it will it will help us uh, grow the game. It'll help us better manage college squash. As you're aware, but some of your listeners might not be, we're one of the few intercollegiate sports where that combines all three divisions. So you've got obviously programs like Stanford in Division One, the Ivy League is Division One, and then you've got Division Two schools as well as a ton of NESCAC schools. So we're we're sort of all over the map in terms of the rules that we're governed by, and I think that. Uh, this new association will help on that front. But more importantly, from my perspective, at least, it'll help us uh, grow the game at the intercollegiate level. And that's where there's, you know, tremendous opportunity. Yeah, it's a great point. You know, and it's interesting with these, when you look at the top level of these governance structures, I mean, I tend to get very excited about this, but if you asked me 10 years ago, I've been like big whoop, but here's what I have seen is, I mean, look, look at U.S. squash as a parallel example quickly. The, at its core back in, you know, 06, 07, they did a governance structure change and they went from a executive board committee structure of like 40 people, you know, all over the map, mostly volunteer room to then really transitioning towards professionalizing it both at the board level and at the staffing level and look at the difference that's made. And so that's why, you know, to me, I see this as such an opportunity for the sport and specifically in this zone of college squash, because as you know, like the passion level at college squash is just off the charts. So I'd be curious a little bit about, you know, what you can share on the conversations that were going on. And this isn't a hard decision. And I would give some parallel here to the men's and women's professional tour where the the men and women merged. And, you know, there's, I think, hesitancies on both ends to the fear of what you're giving up versus what you can gain. And, you know, was that a, was it a slam dunk for all the coaches or was there really consternation and conversation around that? No, I, there, there absolutely was. I mean, this was, again, I'm not on the executive committee for either the men or the women, but there have been discussions regarding this subject for a year and a half, two years, three years. And it is a, a serious topic because you've got two games that have sort of been operating kind of on parallel paths, the men and the women, that historically haven't always made decisions together. I give the Women's Association a lot of credit because they moved to softball, I believe, two years before the men did back in the 90s. This is when I was in college. So, you know, there's been an ebb and a flow about sort of who's been progressive, who hasn't been. And it is important that the men's game and the women's game continue to have their own identity. But for the purposes of making decisions more rapidly for the purposes of having, as I said earlier, you know, rules that we're all governed by, whether it's recruiting rules or eligibility, all these sorts of things. It's, it's just paramount now as the game around us is growing rapidly. You, you mentioned U.S. squash, and we're obviously closely tied to junior squash uh, from the recruiting end. You know, we see that, that every other facet of squash seems to be growing. And, and I think, you know, we definitely are, but it's been more of organic growth. It's, it's kind of like well, John Fry moves from Franklin and Marshall to Drexel. And guess what? You know, it, it's no surprise that with Eric Zilmer, the, the two of them have created a real powerhouse in a relatively short period of time. So I think as an association, if we can work closely with U.S. squash, we can continue that growth and give all of these hundreds of players at the junior level the opportunity to continue to, to play at the next level. A quick question on that in terms of, I mean, your team is at such a high caliber. Do you, people reach out to you in terms of how to build a program and how to grow the sport? I've had discussions with folks. I, there's a school on the West Coast and we'd love to find, you know, to help Stanford find or help them create some programs out on the West Coast so they don't have to travel east four or five mm -hmm. times a year which makes their situation exceedingly difficult from a competitive standpoint. So yeah, I've talked to some folks that are affiliated with the Cal program out West. Actually, before I came to Penn a number of years ago, I was coaching at Milton Academy and I knew that I wanted to get involved with college squash. I'd had discussions with Bob Callahan, my coach, as well as Paul Asianti, Dave Talbot. They were all really encouraging me to look into it. And uh, I was examining it. I, I applied for a uh, assistant job at another Ivy League school. They didn't hire me. They, they hired a great candidate. I will say that. But I, so I went back to Milton Academy and, and thought long and hard about, okay, how 
how am I going to get into college squash? And is there a school out there that would sort of satisfy my need to be competitive along the tiring? And there, are so, there yeah. were so few schools at the time that I thought would be a good fit that I actually had discussions with some folks that were involved with squash and, and had gone to Duke. I mean, I think that's a school that's a real sleeping giant. If they were to uh, start a program, you see what they've done in football and obviously basketball across a number of sports. I mean, so Duke, I completely agree, would be all those schools down there. And, and it's great to see University of Virginia taking the lead, really making that step towards the next level, you know, and and it's a great model. And I, hopefully the other, you know, I see this with the league structure, which the Ivy Leagues is such a, a top model. And a lot of people don't forget that Columbia only started the program was it four, five years ago now? I think so. That sounds about right. I should know because they've quickly become uh, a real force on the men's side and, and the women are, are, are not far behind. Right. So, you know, when you see these big schools, they have, you know, kind of engines. And once they turn it on, they can really make big leaps fast. I mean, look at Drexel as another example. So I completely agree. I see those opportunities of, of these schools coming on board to really propel the sport forward. So let's bring it back to the NCAA level. And, um, you know, I know that squash was listed as an emerging sport uh, a few years ago and, and now where it's fallen off that list. But I see this, uh, the governance structure is another opportunity to really invigorate that. And especially on the women's side, what are your thoughts towards that? Well, absolutely. We, well, I don't want to say we. Uh, I'll speak speak for, for me. You know, I, I think it's imperative that we become an NCAA sport. I think that that would give our sport, uh, you know, legitimacy. And some might argue, well, you don't have to be NCAA. Look at men's rowing. They're not NCAA. Well, they're not, but they're in the Olympics. So, you know, given the fact that we've, we've been trying for years and years to find a way into the Olympics, and that may or may not happen. I sure hope it does. But this, the bar for the NCAA is, is I want to say simpler, but it's easier to understand how we get in. We just have to get a certain number. I think it's 60 sports that have varsity programs. And then we would be eligible to have, to become an NCAA sport, have an NCAA championship, which would hopefully, you know, increase our opportunities to uh, showcase the game and grow it. So it's something that's within our power. I think we certainly have the means if you look at the uh, socioeconomic statistics around who's playing squash in this country. So it's just a question of figuring out you know, what motivates athletic departments, what our value proposition is as squash. An athletic department's perspective, most of your listeners will know that that they're in the mindset today of cutting programs. Well, I think what we need to communicate to them is that this, as far as athletic programs that exist, I mean, this is an affordable one. You can build court, six courts, and that would be enough to certainly start a program. Travel squad size for us in the Ivy League is 12 now. Compare that with with a lacrosse team or, or with a rowing team, for example. And I think there's a real opportunity for us to communicate the value of our sport, talk about you know how successful squash players are, financially, but then in all other areas. I think I heard on one, on one of your other podcasts, you or John Flanagan, you guys were talking about, I think it was John, how, how well educated our, our population is. There are a lot of things that are that are going going for the sport. And not to mention at the base level, there are more and more juniors every year. Mm-hmm. And then the thing that the college coaches understand, because we receive emails from young people around the world, there isn't this suggestion anymore that college squash is where good players will go and, and their games will sort of plateau or in some cases get worse. I mean, that just isn't the case anymore. If you look at who's coaching around the country, it's unbelievable. Terry Lynn Koo is at MIT. You know, John yeah. White's right down the road. I mean, you can't say that these are sort of hack, you know, tennis coaches that have, that have sort of learned the game and are now trying to uh, earn a few extra bucks by coaching squash between November and, and March. That just isn't the case anymore. So I'm yeah. kind of running on here, but but that's uh... no, I completely agree. You know, I think you know the clock kind of starts as soon as you start engaging these conversations, right? And you know, I think the I'm not as familiar with how Dickinson went straight varsity and jumped in, you know, getting a great coach like Chris Sackvey and and building courts, and you know, they're making a go for it at the varsity level. But they obviously were reading the landscape and and wanting to jump in. Closer to home for me is actually Denison, and you know, on the sidelines, I've been there. Exactly. Yeah. On the sidelines, I've been pushing it, talking with various, uh, the athletic director over the years, you know, talking with the squash coach. And and now there's really some building momentum towards getting serious about it. You know, and I think part of that is the groundswell of what's going on at the top level. And I think, you know, by Alonzo, and I know your your dad has been such a a huge asset to the, the university, but specifically the squash program and keeping it alive the past 20 years now. So, you know, I think right now there's really some, some good momentum behind exploring these opportunities of what is 
is what does it take to go varsity? What does it take to build courts? And I'm more optimistic than I, I've always been pretty optimistic, but I'm hoping uh, we can get over that. Uh, well, I think what we have to do to your point about Denison is we've got to keep, you know, we've got to get Denison to the varsity level. Are they, they are at the varsity level. No, no, it's been a club no. team. This is where a new association will help because, you know, the club teams are, are currently mixed with the, the varsity teams at our, our national championships. And so I saw Walter, the Denison coach a few weeks ago and didn't know that they were just a club. But the point I was going to make is that we have to get schools like Kenyon to follow suit because if we're going to grow from coast to coast, I mean, we need to have... I know Notre Dame has a good club mm-hmm. team. I mean, those are two schools, Denison and Notre Dame, that would compete at nothing else other than squash. But we can help our association along with U.S. Squash. We can really help these programs kind of develop regionally and then with the goal of someday, you know, being coast to coast. I don't know if we'll ever crack, crack the Southwest and, and the Southeast but uh, or Texas, but we could we can certainly dream and, and start in the, the colder and the wetter, wetter areas of the country. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, success builds on success. So I, I do see now... I feel like we're getting close to the tipping point and with indicated you know if if Denison goes farsi and starts dipping in toes there it's i think as you said it'll put pressure on um, kenyon and these other schools to really or not pressure but show them that this is possible next we shift the conversation towards pen athletics to hear more from jack on how his squash team fits alongside the other 30 plus teams like football basketball and soccer at this division one prestigious ivy league institution Take a listen. So you reference football, and I'm, I grew up in Ohio, a huge Ohio State football fan, love all college sports, you know, was up till midnight the other night watching the hoops. So the, one great thing about working at an Ivy League sport is that the sports are treated, I think, as equally as any other league in the country. There's not a sense here, at least I don't have the sense, that I'm coaching a sport that's less important to, you know, a revenue producing sport. So we're all friendly with one another. I mean, a lot of the coaches here are, are great friends. So a lot of the other coaches, uh, our women's basketball coach, men's tennis coach, they're all down at the squash courts playing pretty regularly. Our men's lacrosse coach plays. So it's a cohesive group. I feel that obviously it's a great place for me to work. I've been here 13 years. So we do have in the Ivy League, we have, there are some disadvantages in terms of when we can start practice, how many match dates we have, things like that. But we also have a lot of advantages. I mean, obviously the academic the quality of the academics at the Ivy League level is, is unparalleled. And, and one of those other advantages to your question is it, kind of how, how does squash fit into Penn? And I think I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's as, as important as basketball because that wouldn't be the case. But uh, we as squash coaches here feel feel highly valued. And, and I think that we're all measured in the same way. Our athletic director, she wants us to win championships or be competitive in the Ivy League and, and most importantly, help develop our, our student athletes as athletes, as students, but also as people during their four years here. And, and now that I've been here for a long time, I was saying to somebody the other day that it's, it's really exciting. A lot of the young ladies that played for me when I started are, are married and, and now are getting married and having children. So so it, it's a relationship that I have with the school and, and with the team team members that have played for me that goes and goes and goes. Yeah, it just builds on itself after the athletes leave. That's great. Well, at the competitive level, I mean, you guys have been finalists both the past two years at the national championships. And, you know, doing that once is a feat unto itself, but back-to-back performances there. So huge congratulations on there. And I'm, I'm sure you guys are, are competing at the top level. What are your takeaways from both those seasons of what worked and what do you guys, what can you share of what you're going to try to do differently? First of all, in terms of getting to the finals, you can't do that unless you have very talented hardworking student athletes and good coaches around you. And I've been really blessed to have a great relationship with our athletic department and with admissions. And also, I think that our success on court has coincided with um, the school overall becoming more and more attractive every year. Whenever alums come back and ask me, you know, what's going on, you know, the first thing I tell them is just how much easier it's gotten in my 13 years to recruit. And obviously, you know, I think our success has been a part of that, but really our our squash program in a lot of ways just sort of mirrors the school. But in terms of your question, you know, what's gone well, the teams have worked really hard, you know, all the kind of coach cliche stuff. We have a number of young ladies that were national team level, either at the junior level or even at the senior level. I think the team this year, there are at least four young women that have played you know, three young women that either have played or will play this year for their senior national team. So that gives you some idea of, of the just how the, 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 yeah, the, the talent level that exists in college squash. I mean, we're really lucky to have Reham Sedke, 
who's our number one player. She'll be the two seed, I think, at the senior nationals because Amanda, unfortunately, won't be there with an injury. But the talent level is just going through the roof. And, and I'm just kind of lucky to, to steward these young ladies. And hopefully one of these years, we'll uh, we'll catch a break in the finals and be able to get past Harvard, who is, uh, is obviously their program is, is flying high. And they deserve tremendous credit for just winning year in and year out. Completely agree. Well, let's dive in a little bit to how you attract. I know you said that part of the su- your success is mirroring the, the school success, but then, you know, there's also a lot of these athletes do have choices. Can we dive in a little bit to your recruiting yeah. process and kind of the ebbs and flows or the process you go through and the timing and all that? Absolutely. So the first thing for those that aren't familiar with Penn, we have four schools, College of Arts and Sciences, Warden School of Business, Engineering, as well as the Nursing School. So we're somewhat unique in the Ivy League or in our offerings. I mean, we, Benjamin Franklin, founded the school with the purpose of educating young people in a practical way. So when I was applying to college, I think my parents would tell me, you know, oh, you want to go get a broad-based education, liberal arts, that was the way to go. You know, as times have changed, as as the cost of education has increased, more and more families are starting to think about, okay, if I'm going to spend 65000 a year for this, like, I want my child to leave university with some skills that are going to be applicable and will help them get jobs and help them be an immediate success in the real world. So I think Penn is uniquely positioned on that front. And that is sort of the first thing that we share with young people. Because if, for example, I mentioned Reham, if she's known since she was young, I think that she wanted to go into computer science. So we have a great Mm -hmm. engineering department. So the second that I find out that a young person is sort of focused in one area, you know, especially nursing or engineering or business, we highlight those strengths that we have here at Penn. And for those that aren't sure exactly what they want to do, you know, we, we would guide them to the College of Arts and Sciences. So that's the background in terms of what Penn offers that is special. The thing that I've tried to do during my time here when recruiting is do as much listening as possible. Because mm-hmm. when I started, you know, I was so excited to, to try to build a winner and get people in here that like, I don't think I allowed the recruits or their parents to get kind of a word in edgewise. Whereas now what I try to do is allow them to communicate what they're interested in, what they want the squash program to be like, and to see if there's a fit. And and for those where it feels like, you know, Penn would be at the top of their list, then we'll share what I feel makes this program special. I mean, I make no bones when in the fall, for example, fall visits are becoming fewer and far between because the recruiting cycle is moving up, you know, towards to mimic some other sports like lacrosse and field hockey where kids are committing earlier and earlier. But when I started, at least most of the the top players would commit in the fall of their senior year. And I don't know if it was by accident or on purpose, but, but we would have a lot of them in for their official visits on Fridays. And those were days that we would run the stadium steps in Franklin Field. Mm-hmm. And after thinking about it, I guess after the first year or second year, I can't remember. I love this because sometimes recruits would stand at the bottom watching because they can't participate in the workouts. And they would be sort of gulping and like, holy smokes, like, I, I don't want any part of this. And then other times kids would be like, I love this. Like these right. girls are super tough and they're slamming up these stairs and doing, you know, sets of whatever, and then coming back, taking a rest and doing a second set. So if someone was attracted to that hard work and what we were doing, then I, I kind of knew from the jump that, that we would be a place they might be interested in. And so we've sort of founded our program on trying to be fit and, and, and outwork our opponents and um, just doing little things like that in the recruiting process. Obviously, technology is a huge part of it. You've got it. And that's evolved in the years since I've been here. Initially, it was all about phone calls. And now kids are on Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter. Actually, not even Twitter. That's like seems sort of passe. <laughs> I find that like right. you and I are on Twitter. Yeah, but exactly. the 16, 17 year olds, like they're on Snapchat and Snapchat, Instagram. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm old and getting gray, but but I'm trying my hardest to uh, stay current with all these new offerings on social media. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you try and test that chemistry of and, and finding that right fit, you know, and giving that litmus test of do you want to be here or not, uh, which is, you know, I think applicable to whether it's jobs or, you know, anything. Right. But in terms of the where the your recruiting process goes now like what what are the common questions that you get asked all the time just from the get-go to help people guide them okay so the first question is you know what's the minimum sat requirement or what 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 does penn like to see you know in terms of sats and the way the ivy league operates as far as recruited student athletes goes is we we have an academic index which isn't terribly complicated is we just look at a, a young person's grades in the in the core subjects in high school freshman sophomore junior year and then we we 
add to that the their SAT or ACT results. And there's an output number that's between zero and 240. 240 would be perfect SATs, all A's in high school, freshman through junior year. A lot of people will ask, well, if I go to this nationally renowned private school, do A's at that school mean more than A's at a public school? And the answer is no. An A is an A in in terms of the Ivy League. And I'm not going to weigh in on whether or not that's fair or not. It's just this is the way that the Ivy League has chosen to evaluate the prospective student athletes. So minimum SAT marks would be a common question. And the the answer is, you know, if you follow the um, algorithm, there isn't really a minimum because if you have all straight A's, then Penn or whatever Ivy League school can be a little bit more flexible with the SATs. But just in terms of giving your listeners a hard answer, and, and again, I want to stress that if your child gets a 1250 or a 1300, it's not guaranteed that they're going to get into an Ivy League school, but that's just sort of the benchmark now that if, if you're sort of below that 1250 level, it's going to be really tough to get you into an Ivy League school. But again, I want to stress that every Ivy League squash program approaches this in a different way. But I'd mm-hmm. say, you know, 1300 definitely gets the conversation started. Does that answer the question? Sure. Yeah. And then is that the IV index? Is that applied? Is it on a school basis or on a, does football have the same requirements as, uh, you know, all, all the sports use the academic index, right? I mean, in terms of like the criteria, so it's, it's just the standardized for each school. Oh, and are you asking like, do squash players need to be smarter than other athletes? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know as much about that because I, I, to be fair with the listeners, I have no idea. We have an academic index average that we on the squash programs have to maintain. I don't know if other sports here have a number that's higher or lower. I just know that I think overall we have to be like a 214 or something like that as a department. And that's what our number is in squash. So I don't know. Uh, You'd have to call another Mm -hmm. coach to ask about about what their uh, index average is. Yeah. I don't know how well a a lacrosse interview would go over on squash radio, but you can always try. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and obviously you play point in terms of coordinating with the parents and the the student athlete, but does your team get involved at all in the recruiting process? If we can't ask team members to reach out, but in the instances where a lot of times because the squash world is so small, the team members will come to me and say, hey, I know this kid that she's from my club. He's from my club. Like you definitely should be talking to this person. So they're already actively engaged in the process. But the formal way that they would be involved would be if the young person were to come on campus for an unofficial visit, which typically kind of happens now of their mm-hmm. junior year or fall of their senior year. So now being you know spring of the junior year. But when we bring prospective student athletes onto campus, absolutely, we get our our team involved. They'll stay with them overnight. They'll take them, you know, to classes. We try to organize activities and dinners to give recruits as good of a understanding of what happens at Penn, even though you've got to condense that into 24 or 48 hours. I want to shift gears towards a little bit of where the future Penn squash is going. And there's some, um, you know, what can you share with us about What's on the horizon? Yeah, so we're in the process now and have been for a number of years of looking to upgrade our facility. Nothing has been finalized at the university level, but I'm able to report that we've received tremendous support, alumni support in terms of wanting an upgrade to our facility, but they're not just talking about it. I mean, they're, they've are they been very supportive. And I hope that in the, uh, maybe as a as an addendum to this podcast, in a short period of time, we can talk again and, and speak more about what that facility upgrade will look like. But the bottom line is this, is that we Penn converted 10 courts, what was 18 courts, 18 North American hardball courts to 10. And we have utilized those uh, over the past 20 years or so. And squash, as we referenced earlier, is just growing so much that, that we want to be able to host the big junior tournaments that typically Harvard you know, Princeton, Trinity, Yale will host on a regular basis. So we want to be able to do, host those. We want to be able to host the intercollegiate championships. And we're really optimistic that once we get this facility upgraded, we will be able to do that again. For example, when I when I was a junior squash player, which is ages ago in the 80s, <laughs> but 80s and 90s, but Penn hosted the 100 lot every year. And then every other year, or every third or fourth year hosted the um, junior nationals and hosted intercollegiate championships. I think I remember reading Jim Zug's uh, article about a Yale versus Yale Harvard match that happened on the back courts at Ringe and nobody saw it. But that I read that and just thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could host those again and 
obviously in the future, if that happens, we'll uh, we'll try to get those big matches on the the front courts instead of the uh, the back ones in the facility. So that's that's really what what we're working hard on, kind of behind the scenes here. You know, we feel that our program, both the men and the women, and obviously I've been with the women for 13 years, but coached was the head coach of both for six, and now you know I'm really lucky to work with Gilly Lane, who I know you have known for ages. He's been on the U.S. squash board and and was a perennial national team member. So, and he's, he's taken over the men's program. So I feel like we're uniquely positioned or well positioned to, uh, continue to improve on both the men's side and, and the women's side. And we just need a, a facility that kind of matches the, the caliber of our uh, student athletes. Yeah, well, we're excited to uh, to follow that and, and uh, share more when you can. Well, one of the last things I want, the topics I want to touch on is also your involvement with the national team, specifically the junior national team. And you helped guide them to one of their best finishes in that era. And talk a little bit about, you know, representing your country is a unique opportunity and you've done it both at the player level but then also the coaching level so love to hear your thoughts on on team usa yep so i was lucky enough when i was a junior to play in the individuals when i was 16 in paderborn germany in 1990 and then again as a junior team member in hong kong in 1992 and for the squash geeks out there that you know are kind of jumping onto Wikipedia, that that was a big. The '92 year was a big year for North American squash because John Power, who was a year younger than me, made the final of the World Juniors, which I think was really important in terms of establishing that that good squash could be played in North America. So I'll never forget, you know, having the opportunity to play there, but really more just watching top level squash and seeing, you know, a kid that I grew up with, Jonathan, be able to beat, you know, every other junior in the world except for one Finnish guy named Juha Romulan that didn't quite have the uh, senior career that John had. Anyway, yeah, it was really lucky that shortly after I started at Penn, that, this was back when uh, Kevin started at US, with U.S. Squash and uh, VJ was his right-hand man at the time and they were based here in Philadelphia. This was before the move to New York and I believe it was Shabana Khan who was the uh, junior women's coach for whatever reason uh, stepped down and, and they were kind of left in a lurch and it was one of those right time, right place. I jumped in and said, absolutely, I'll be the interim guy. I'll take you know the teams wherever wherever they need to go and work with the parents and, and the club coaches. Was took the ladies to I think it was two thousand seven, we went to Hong Kong. You know, and one mm-hmm. thing that I, I remember distinctly about that that trip and that tour was that uh, U.S. squash made a real statement, at least in my mind, because we asked them if we could take the ladies to, you know, just thinking about jet lag and, you know, the, the idea that if you travel 12 hours to a time zone that's 12 hours different, you need 12 days to adjust. So we didn't quite mm-hmm. get 12 days of, of support from U.S. squash, but they allowed us to go to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and, and compete against uh, their junior national team a week in advance of those championships in Hong Kong. We end up doing well. We beat Australia, which I think was the first time that our junior women had ever done it. Finished eighth, solid finish at the time. Move on to 2009 and uh, the team continued to get better. We had uh, Olivia Blatchford and then a young young lady who I guess people have heard of, Amanda Sobey. She was, <laughs> she was two on the team that year and ended up finishing fourth in 09 in India. And uh, again, in 11, had both Amanda and Olivia in the team. Their, their positions were reversed. This this was another example of how U.S. squash evolved rapidly and did everything they could to help us be competitive. You know, they were successful in getting the bid. It was moved from Egypt for, I guess, safety reasons, moved it to Cambridge, and Harvard was able to host. And, and that year, I think we finished second, losing to Egypt 2-1 in the final. So it was, it, was, it was a great opportunity. I had a lot more success on the coaching side than I did on the playing side, and that is due in large part to, uh, really, to, uh, to Amanda and Olivia. When they aged out, I wisely uh, stepped aside and let let Scott Devoy take over, but he's clearly done a great job yeah. with I think two uh, second place finishes to his credit. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was it's great to meet the national team coaches when you play in those events. We I didn't discuss college squash a lot when I was working with the national team, but but I would always whenever I'd get a, a national team coach from another country like Oliver from Germany or Dick from Hong Kong, I, I would try to stress, hey, you know this college squash thing is something you should 
encourage your uh, young uh, team members to uh, consider. And, and I don't think I made much headway at the time, but but fortunately now uh, we're seeing the feelings that existed once about, you know, America was a place where you go and your squash deteriorates to being the opposite, where it's a place that you can get a great education, you know, at a place like Penn, and then even continue on at the next level, like what Gilly did, like what Ali did, Ali Farag and, and Amanda. And we're hopeful here at Penn that, that Reham decides in two years, once she finishes up, to play for the U.S. for a few years. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it, you're just seeing the success building on success. And it's these student athletes that then go on to to be so involved in the game at whatever capacity, whether it's coaching or playing, it, it really it makes a difference. And I think that's all contributing towards the growth that we're seeing at the, the national level. So, well, I'm going to switch to our quick fire segment of this episode, but thank you for all your thoughts on, on squash. And it's been a pleasure talking there, but yeah, now we want to get to know a little bit more insight about you. And um, we do that through a series of questions. So are you ready? Fire away. All right. Fire away. What is your favorite mode of transportation? It would have to be my car. I have a 29 mile commute every day. It would have to be my car where it's comfortable, it's quiet, and to date, knock on wood, it's gotten me here safely every day. Great. Next question What gets you fired up? And this can either be something within Squash World, it can be out of Squash World, and it can be obviously something positive, but then also, you know, something that frustrates you. So, what gets you fired up? Well, what gets me fired up on, in the positive sense is what this podcast has been all about, and it's it's trying to grow the game. Obviously, I'm I'm trying to to grow the program here at Penn along with Gilly, but we do have a larger mission of of trying to uh, grow the game at the intercollegiate level. And I would love to see us be uh, an NCAA sport within five to ten years. That gets me fired up. In terms of on a day to day coaching basis, I think if you ask my team members, they would tell you that that I'm not a big fan of the trickle boast. Like it's uh, it's a shit shot and hopefully you can, well, you, you can leave that in there. It really exposes, you know, the opposite corner if you don't hit it properly. And and I know, you know, people will say, and especially young people that, that get PSA TV, they'll say, oh, but the pros hit it all the time. Well, okay, yes, they do. They hit it all the time. But there's a couple of big differences. A, they're a lot faster than you and I are. B, they play on a glass court. And C, it's a 17-inch tin. So for those that are mere mortals that play on, you know, hot college courts like we do here at Ringe, I get fired up in a negative way about the trickle boast. <laughs> I like it. Well, you're going to have to make your your team listen to this to hear it one more time. I don't um, think my team is going to get to minute whatever we're on, you know, 45, <laughs> but maybe I can send I can edit home. this. Yeah, I can edit this into a clip and you can send it out. What's your favorite movie or documentary? Oh, favorite movie. I love Shawshank. I know everybody says that, but yeah. it's a great one. Glory is another movie that I love. Oh, and then silly me. No, the absolute best movie of all time is Rocky four. So <laughs> when it's true, so are you saying that because you're in Philly or no, 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 no. My relationship with Rocky four predated living in the Philadelphia area. So Wednesday before nationals, this is when I was a junior squash player. First of all, I was at Rocky four. I made my mom bring me like at the 11 a.m. opening at some movie theater in Cincinnati. I don't know if I skipped school or if I didn't have school, but I was there the day that it opened and loved the movie. Ended up like buying, it was the only VHS tape we owned. And I would watch that movie the Wednesday night before nationals. U.S. Nationals every year. We Living in Cincinnati, we would always travel on Thursday, so we'd get there a day in advance. My coach, Don Mills, was big on preparation and eliminating you know, any uh, potential distractions or anything that could reduce our standard of play. But so my Wednesday night routine was to watch Rocky IV to get fired up. I don't know how, how well that contributed to my sleep that night, but that would have to be my number one movie. And then obviously it gave you my two and three. Isn't that, if I'm remembering my Rocky history, that is where it's basically US, yeah, USA versus yeah. Russia. It's hey look, it's all come for full circle. Right now it's USA Russia again with the you know, the Trump and uh with all of uh the allegation that Trump is in cahoots with Putin. Yeah. So yeah, well, no, it's, everybody it's needs limiting. to watch that movie and appreciate yeah. that the Cold War is over, but differences exist. Yeah. Well, so I'm gonna you can't use Rocky Four as your answer for the next question. Okay. And this is what is something that and it could be an activity or something that brings you disproportionate happiness? Oh, just being with my kids. I was just, just on 
spring break, and my wife and I were able to sort of swim with them every day, build sandcastles, play sports. That to me is the activity at yeah. the moment. I mean, they're we have three boys, they're six, five, and four. So this is the stage where when you walk them into school in the morning, they hold your hands. Well, actually not the seven-year-old, but the other two do. And uh, you really can't do any, any wrong quite yet. So um, I guess we're in the salad days. So that's the activities that I think give my wife and I the most joy at the moment. I have two nephews and uh, yeah, th- around the same age and they're great kids and they're like it's fun seeing their personalities develop and even at a you could see it at a young age kind of like what you think they're going to be and it just gets reinforced and year after year it's great yeah this week has been fun too because for some reason all three and they have a very their their love for sports is it varies you know one maybe a little more than the other you know but the they all three got into the NCAA tournament oh, really? and got into it, like started like watching the day games when they yeah. could. And, and so they, they rushed into our bedroom on Tuesday morning. Dad, dad, highlights, highlights. Who won the game? <laughs> Did UNC win the game? So yeah, it's, it's, it's stuff like that, that. Do they have a, is there a fan favorite for them yet? Or um, is it still too early? Well, Ohio State football, Penn football, Penn squash is their absolute number one team. They have a lot of, of Penn squash of t-shirts, of course, you know, and it's pretty cool when we do intros and, and to look through the glass back and, and see them like sitting there just kind of watching the whole thing unfold. But oh, well, then offshore Liverpool, definitely. They're playing at three o'clock today, as a matter of fact. Nice. And I realize actually for my next question that given you know, the amount of duties you have in your life, you may not have an answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there anything new that you're thinking of trying? You know, it could be a routine. It could be a habit, something that you're, you're looking to incorporate, something new you're looking to try and, and why? Something new. There hasn't a lot, been a lot of new that's happened in my life. Well, something we're doing new at school this spring, and maybe this is a stretch in terms of answering it, but historically our, our spring training at Penn with the programs has been very structured very organized. And uh, this year I decided, I mean, the ladies had such a good year. I, th- I think they went like 14 and two or something like that, 13 and something and two. And I decided that, that I wasn't going to structure much and I was just going to allow them to figure out what their spring training program was going to be. Mm-hmm. So maybe the answer to your question is something new. I'm just trying to relax a little bit, trying to yeah. uh, not be as uh, intense and high, high strung but we'll see how this, uh, no, I, how this goes. Jack, that is, that's actually, I know you, that's big. That's a huge step, <laughs> like letting go of the control and the, and you bring such a, in a positive way, the level of intensity that I think energizes people. So yeah, that's, that, I like that. That works. If you had to, you're familiar with Ted talks. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I want to give you a scenario where you had to give a TED talk, but it wasn't something that you're, let's say on your bio that you're as known for. So you have the opportunity here to really kind of either share something that people might not know about you or try something new, and then you have to give a TED talk on it. So what would you do in in that case? Well, if I had to give a TED talk about something other than squash, I've just been really lucky in my life to be around, to have great mentors, to have great parents, to have great coaches. And I guess what I would try to do, and this is this is what I try to do every day here at, at Ringe, is to impart, I say life lessons, but I, that might come out like I'm some deep philosopher or something like that. It's not. It's just more like little tips and tricks, things that I've learned over the years, you know, that, that I think will be successful. So, for example, my dad is like big with on face-to-face meetings. And mm-hmm. I used to always, he'd always say to me, you know, go to this good thing, go to this thing. And I'd say, oh, I, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to go to the lecture. And he goes, well, if you don't go, it's guaranteed that nothing will happen. He goes, if you do go, something might happen. And, you know, when I was young, I'm sort of like, what does this guy know? Yeah. But now as I get older, and now that I'm coaching young people who are so rooted and connected to their phones and their computers and these electronic devices, I find that this advice is like more important now than it even was for us when we were in our 20s. Because sure. young people today, if we were to say to them, did you speak to that? Did you talk to that person? They'll answer yes. Well, if you dig a little deeper, what a co- when, you, when you say that to a college kid, really what they're saying is that they texted with them. So their no interaction way. was like wow. line by line. So part of what I would try to give a TED Talk about as Again, not an expert, but it's about some of the things that I've learned coaching this generation because I'm guessing I graduated from college in 96. If we compared a 96 person to like an 86, for example, I don't think there'd be a whole 
I mean, musical interests were different, but there aren't that many differences, really. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to compare the 96 to an 06 or 2016, completely different, just because technology has revolutionized their lives and it's made the way people interact. It's changed it dramatically. I mean, you look at this medium podcast, right? Like it wasn't even here really two or three years ago. So that would be something that I would like to just share my experiences with people in in the hopes that, that it could help older people, people in their 40s like myself, connect with this younger generation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and I think I'm sure you could just to kind of touch on that is people try and silo parts of their lives, I feel like. So like my squash game is different from my family life from, you know, and yes and no, I feel like there's so many parts that if if something's going on in other aspects of your life, there's an imbalance. And, you know, I think what sounds like you're trying to say this is how you can bring balance to your life. And by sharing experiences, I think that's helpful. It's not always directly applies, but people can have good takeaways to then adapt. Right? Well, yeah. And as a coach, I mean, that's what motivates us. It's why we wake up in the morning. I mean, my life is in this weird place now where I've got young kids and then I've got college kids that I work with. I have no idea. If you were to ask me about teenagers, I'm clueless. I have no no idea about what sort of makes them tick and how they operate. But in terms of, you know, young boys and in terms of college age women, like it's we're just I'm just trying to like coach them and teach them like how to kind of be the best they can on a day in, day out basis and I don't know. It's what motivates you know, you're gonna have to go back and edit this part a little bit, but what motivates us as coaches is helping people of whatever age get the most out of their talent, out of their ability. Yeah, completely agree. Well, the closing question we have for you is if you could recommend any book or books, what would you recommend and why? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I've listened to two or three of your other podcasts. And uh, the only thing I was anxious about was this question, because <laughs> the truth is, I don't even know the last book that I read. And I, I could blame my, my three children or the two teams on that, but I, I'm not. It's just, it's my own damn fault. But the one thing, if I can pivot, the one thing that I would say is that I think podcasts have replaced reading in my life in terms of where mm. I get my entertainment and my news. I love listening to, uh, well, the truth is I'm not afraid to, I love listening to Howard Stern on the way to work, but you can draw your own conclusions from that. But then in terms of at night, you know, when I'm, when I'm going to bed, I'll listen to, uh, all sorts of different podcasts, sports, politics, news, whatever. But the one that I've grappled onto and the, and the answer to the question is I would encourage everyone to go out to listen to David Axelrod's interview with Joe Madden, who's the uh, Chicago Cubs manager. And it really resonated with me in terms of how well he grasps how to work with young people. Mm-hmm. He's done it for 30 years. And it was amazing to see how he's progressed as a coach and as a manager in terms of, he used to sort of use the stick. He talks about like how when he was a minor league coach, I think he he would find his players occasionally. And he realized over the years that like, you know, that might've worked in the fifties and the sixties, but this generation today, it just doesn't, it doesn't connect with them. Like, okay, if you want to bench them like that, that might resonate with a little bit more, but I really loved listening to his perspective on coaching and being involved in sports because he's obviously somebody that if you just have, you know, five or six years ago, he was considered like wacko and out there. And now he's, he manages the best team in baseball. Yeah. Well, I also have a little confession too, that I think if if someone asked me that right now, I would probably have to, um, what book or books I'd recommend it be referencing something probably I read more of a year ago. And I I tend to go on in sprees of, you know, if there's a subject matter, yeah, binge, you know, and I really, I'm more nonfiction. That's probably not entirely healthy from every perspective, but I really like learning new things. So and podcasting has just really opened my eyes to that. And I think similar to you, like the spectrum of what you can have, it's, I listen to it sometimes for entertainment, sometimes to learn stuff and, you know, a lot of learning about other people. So uh, I'd be in the same boat as you. Connor, yeah. if I can just jump in quickly, I, I think this is great what you're doing for our sport in terms of as somebody that listens to you know soccer podcasts like Bill Simmons, you know anything and everything I can get my hands on, a bunch of CNN ones. I think it's great what you're doing in terms of just getting different stories out about our sport, and I encourage you to keep doing it. And I was really you know thrilled uh, to be part of it. Well, that's a good note for me to close on. But uh, no, thank you, and I'm as enthusiastic about the medium and where what's how we tell the stories what stories we tell you know that i'm i'm gonna listen to 
to feedback and audience and uh, anyone that has thoughts. I'm excited to, to help do that. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate all the time you've taken today out of your schedule and uh, looking forward to ha- having you on in the future. My pleasure. Anytime, Kyle. Thank you so much for your time today and for joining us on Squash Radio. We hope you enjoyed this latest episode. But before you leave, we just have one quick last message. As you know, Squash Radio wants to help tell some of the best stories from Squash World. But in order to do that, we want and welcome your help. Do you know a person or a story that involves squash that is interesting, funny, moved you, you care about, reflects your passion for the sport, well, share it with us and let's try and get it out there on the air. You can email me at squashradio at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. Again, thanks for your time and, well, until next time, be well and have fun. Mm -hmm.